You just press play on the Last Breath Hunt cast, home of the Huntroversy. We're here to entertain, educate, and engage. And in case you didn't know, you only live once. But if you do it right, once is enough. Don't waste it. Good morning. Welcome one. Welcome all to episode number 113 of the Last Breath Hunt Cast presented by Badlands Gear. I'll be your host this morning, Grant Putnam, and I have one heck of a guest coming on today. Sam Ubel from the Chase Nation is going to be joining me really here shortly. I consider Sam to be one of the top digital producers in the outdoor television, outdoor media space. He's got a great eye, got a great team of guys behind him. They kill good quality bucks with good quality storylines, and I'm just a big fan of Sam's work. Um, like I said, earlier in episode number 112, when I talked to Alex Nadolski from The Rise Hunt, I really think The Rise Hunt chase nation and midwest whitetail are top a top three levels of production storytelling in the digital space um not saying that other traditional television markets aren't great i love watching the crush crush big bucks too i love watching pat and nicole the boys from heartland bow hunter but i'm just specifically talking about the digital space here i think chase nation the rise and midwest wildtail just do an absolutely stellar job with everything that they do produce and put out so before i give sam a call got to pay a few bills here If you're interested in anything related to Badlands, site-wide we have a discount for 30% off of any piece of gear you'd like to buy. Whether you'd like to get into a bino harness, a new pair of jackets, bibs, etc., tops, bottoms, hats, beanies, gaiters, gloves, uh, gaiters for your feet as well. Um, I know that when I talk about gaiters, I'm talking about a neck gaiter, but they also make gaiters for your boots. You can get that through the last breath inner circle which is our facebook group we've got a nice code for all of the people that are part of that community uh, and that's about 30 percent off so this podcast would also not be possible without the help of outdoor edge knives and cutlery so from everything from gut hooks to replaceable blade utility knives fillet knives anything that you would like to add to your cutlery arsenal if you're interested in breaking a buck down from the field to the freezer you can do that with their lineup under warmer the third partner of our podcast here. They're a heated base layer system that you simply open, air activate, and you've got four large heating pads on the front, four large heating pads on the back. And the coolest thing about Underwarmer is they can reduce the amount of base layers you have to wear, and they're extremely economical. Um, Last winter, I bought a couple for $8 at your local Walmart, and uh, I think that's really going to help you guys out, especially those of you that are going to be going out into those temperature ranges that are below 10 degrees. The fourth member hopping on is Moultrie Mobile, uh, specifically the new Moultrie Delta Cam. It's uh, Moultrie's new cell cam that they just launched about two months ago uh, in the summer of 2021. We have 32 of them running as a team right now. They're giving us some great picture quality, great inventory, great data. And I know that when October and November come around, they're really going to help us pinpoint and uh, know when to really solidify and make that move on these bucks that we're trying to to take out of the field. So without further ado, we're going to go ahead and give the man of the hour, Mr. Sam Ubel of the Chase Nation, a call. Pick his brain, learn about who he is and just discuss about Chase Nation, learn some of the things that Sam does, and uh, really just pick his brain as a master editor, producer, and uh, anything of the like. So here we go. Right on time. Oh, man. Just like (laughs) I like it. You were too. First pickup, man. You were ready. (laughs) Yeah, well, the work-life balance with kids... um, you tend to find yourself, you know, kind of paying more attention to these sorts of things uh, than maybe prior to children because um, you only get so many minutes, you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, before we talk about your family and your kids, go ahead and introduce yourself. Um, I certainly don't need an introduction from you, but everybody that's listening does, and I think that they should definitely know you if they do not already because Like I mentioned before I called you here, you come out with some beautiful production, some top-notch stuff, and got a really exciting project in the works, which maybe we'll unveil here. Um, Maybe not. Maybe we could just talk about it. But, um, yeah, give the listeners a brief introduction of who you are, what you do, and all about your baby that you created called Chase Nation, Sam. 
Ah, oh, thanks. I appreciate the introduction. Yep. So my name is Sam Ubel. Um, I have been uh, an outdoor writer for, gosh, uh, two decades now, and uh, since I was real young, and um, that kind of opened a lot of doors to me and, and gave me some opportunities to meet some folks that brought me onto their uh, television shows and and DVD series and uh, and. I, from that, I had also dabbled with cameras for quite a bit, um, just from watching outdoor television, and uh, that's kind of how I got my feet wet. You know that, and um, and 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 also my dad always asking me what I wanted to be when I grew up, and I always said I wanted to be a professional fisherman or a professional hunter. Hell um, yeah, that's like a good guys a good I response. TV, yeah, you know, and 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 he always told me to follow my dreams, but recommended a, as a side hustle. Maybe you should think about since you love hunting and fishing so much being a fireman you get the three uh what is it four on three off or three yeah. on four off something like that yep and uh you know um anyway so in 2016 um i had uh, filmed uh, another season and and produced all the content for wisconsin whitetail pursuit for the second year in a row mm -hmm. and um i just sort of felt like you know what i've got such a passion for doing this and been doing it pro bono for you know others why not why not start my own my own show um but i wanted to do something different that uh you know kind of set us apart from uh the rest because it, it, it if you know if you take a look at youtube or any online streaming um platform it, it's quite saturated really so it's mm -hmm. sort of like who do you pick who do you yeah. pick to watch right so we we've really dedicated a lot of uh, our attention to the finer details and story to visual storytelling, um, paying attention to increasing our quality of our content and production quality, uh, even just the editing and, and directing. Uh, it's, it's unscripted 95%, but I do like to put together intros before some of the uh, films, mm -hmm. uh, just to suck in the viewer. And, um, and you know, those aren't necessarily scripted, they are directed. I usually just have an idea in my head, and then we just sort of uh, put it together as we go. It ends up being pretty cool. So, so that's a little bit about me and and who I am. And Chase Nation is my baby. <laughs> yeah. Been we're in our fifth season right now. Um, and uh, I guess you could say we're we're kind of in that underground uh, uh, outdoor filmmaking uh, category, much to the likes of uh, Last Breath and The Breaking Point and a few others that are you know, in our category. Yeah, I, I would totally agree with that. And for those of you guys that are listening out there right now, kind of trying to push some numbers around in your head, you're probably wondering, um, A, how old Sam is, and B, what Sam does when he's not working on Chase Nation. So, Sam, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, you know, um, I get that question a lot. Is uh, Chase Nation your full-time mm -hmm. gig? And I would always say, you know, no, it's a moonlight profession. But <laughs> if I actually look at yeah. the hours invested, I wouldn't say it's necessarily 40 hours a week. Mm -hmm. But there are times where it pushes, you know, to the neighborhood of 25 to 30 hours in a week. Um, sometimes we might hit 40 in a week, you know, under the stars. But, yeah, um, you know, it, 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 it really is a moonlight profession. Uh, it simply does not earn enough uh, to leave my day job. Um, mm -hmm. I am a, uh, I, I work in the ID, IT department. I'm a data warehouse developer and BI specialist. So I'm, I'm the, I'm the data geek that builds data warehouses and business intelligence or BI reports, you know, automated dashboards and whatnot. <laughs> sure. All the, all the, you know, the, the glitz and glam on the computer screen that, that helps make business decisions. Yeah, that that's a uh, that's interesting. I did not know that that uh, that that was exactly what you did. I knew you were something related to computers, but I did not know that you were in kind of that systems and software management um, field. Yeah. So so that's pretty interesting. It kind of paves the way. I'm sure there's you know quite a quite a few people out there that are thinking you know how did how the hell did Sam learn how to put together you know this this thing that he's doing right now called chase nation and uh i'm sure that that background helps you at least a little bit being handy with computers because holy shit once you take yeah. the dive into being a outdoor producer you gotta know quite a few things to get it all up and running um beyond even just how to edit video so 
Well, um, that's just yeah. it. I mean, if that truly is it, you wouldn't be. Well, you might not be because you you kind of do a similar role. But I mean, if 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 uh, I've got quite a large team, I've got mm-hmm. twelve other people or thirteen now um, that uh, that are under the Chase Nation umbrella or part of the Chase Nation family, and sure. and half of these guys, well, more than half of them are all in the trades and. Um, they don't really spend a lot of time on the computer, so it's it's oftentimes humorous to me. You know, I mean, they're okay with getting their email off their, their smartphones, you know, and they're <laughs> pretty decent at social media, but they're not great at it even yet. So, sure. I mean, when it comes to uh, anything computer-related, I get it all. I field a lot of questions. <laughs> yes. But, uh, oh, you know what? I didn't. I don't ever talk about that, but I am, uh, I am 38 years old. Okay. Um, that's gotcha. uh I've never said that out loud to anybody, I don't think. So <laughs> Well <laughs> <first> you, <laughs> that's uh are, what are you trying what are you trying to hide? Are you uh are you saying, <laughs> are you trying to masquerade around as uh as a twenties or uh you know, I, I don't know. What do you I wonder why that is. I don't feel like yeah, I didn't I did not know that you're thirty eight. To be honest, I thought you were a little older than me. I thought you were about Garrett's age, about that thirty, thirty one ballpark. I did not realize you were thirty eight. Yeah, I've been um I don't know. I, I, I guess as as time goes by here each year, you know, when I was 35, I, I felt like I was still pretty young, but I felt like after 35, it was like, <laughs> boy, I'm just inching towards 40 now. And <laughs> I see all these young guns out there, you know, doing what I love doing, hunting and filming. And, mm-hmm. um, I'm just like, I don't know, I'm turning into that old guy, I guess. You, you, could almost, you can almost see it, you know, if, if you watch a lot of these out, outdoor programs, Midwest Whitetail or Drury Outdoors or any of your favorite, um, you know, outdoor shows, mm-hmm. uh, the popular ones, even, even especially like our, our category, um, you know, our kind of underground film category, we're, we're, most of the crews are younger folks, like mid to, well, mid to upper 20s and some in low 30s. But, you know, on our team, I'm the oldest one. Um, I've got... I think four or five of us that are in the mid 30 range and then a couple in the low thirties and then, uh, several in the, uh, mid to upper twenties. Um, so we're kind of all across the board, but I mean, when we first started, you know, shoot, I was in my earlier thirties and, uh, we had guys that were 22, 23 years old, young guns, uh, still getting in bar fights and all that, (laughs) (laughs) you know, I stay away from that stuff these days. That's probably a good idea. (laughs) You don't want to take uh, a rogue uh, bush light or bud light cr- crumpled up bottle to the neck. Oh, that man. would uh, that would ruin a guy's day really quick. Yeah, well, if we ever get a chance, I got a good story about a couple of bush light bottles in a bar. Uh, <laughs> that uh, that'll have you rolling. It's a pretty good one. Well, um, I mean, you we got to tell it now. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah, go for it. I was just thinking, you know, um, as as we're as we're talking about the subject here. Um, couple of the younger guys on the crew uh, are what now 20 i want to say 26 27 maybe mm-hmm. um but you know one of these guys uh he just he's just got this history of uh getting himself into situations out of taverns <laughs> when he's not even looking for a fight and he it probably is because of his uh you know his stature he's a He's a bigger guy. He's got pretty big muscles, and you know, I think uh, other guys in the bar that you know uh, think that they're beefy or whatever, and they're the same age group and <laughs> testosterone-driven, right? Um, tend to move in on that guy and 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 get into the wrong place at the wrong time. And I mean that because Nate is the guy. And Nate Nate's last fight that I know of at a bar um, it was like a year and a half ago or something. He. <laughs> He didn't. He he didn't start it, but he kind of finished it. He ended up breaking his fist. Holy um, shit! Punching somebody, and he never stopped throwing those punches, and he just kept swinging, and he he didn't wind up uh, on the rug. Now the story that I'm talking about <laughs> was um, this on film project rug. we're working on with HHA. Yep. Um, we were up in the center part of the state of Wisconsin uh, mm-hmm. filming a, a bow shoot mission. Uh, it, it, it's, it's, this is part of HHA USA. Um, and what it is, is just to give a quick background, HHA USA is, um, is founded by Chris Ham, who's, um, one of the owners and presidents of, uh, 
uh, and co-founders of HHA Sports make the bow sights and the yep. uh, and they make the stabilizers and whatnot. Well, and and they make rests. Well, so Chris and I were talking prior to the season, and uh, he asked me if I'd be interested in helping him put a film together to kind of serve as a documentary that we would, uh, if if done right, we would submit to the Badlands Film Festival. Yep. Um, and I said, absolutely, that's right up my alley. Uh, what do you have in mind? And he said, well, you know, the whole mission behind what we're trying to do with HHA USA is rehabilitate our veterans, especially those combating PTSD, um, through the therapeutic uh, release they get from redirecting their focus when they shoot bows, you know, archery. Um, has a in the outdoors has a way of distracting the mind and taking you to a place uh, outside of your your norm. Yeah, I'm sure anybody that's a hunter can relate. You oh know? hell yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and and so I was like, well, heck yeah, let's do this. So mm-hmm. I got a bunch of the. Oh, I asked everybody on the crew if they wanted to come along and shoot their bows at this uh, event, and I said what well, what I had been planning on doing. And, I'd need a couple of uh, right-hand men, a uh, right-hand men to uh, to join me and help run camera and, and audio and um, lighting if we needed it and anything else. And I mean, I think only three people were unable to attend, and the only reason they didn't come is because they just couldn't make it. So sure. uh, everybody wanted to be in support of this. You know, it's an awesome cause, and we are all super respectful of our military. Yeah. Well, um, we were up there shooting this. Uh, you know, filming this project. And that night, uh, the closest place to the Toma area where we were, Warren's Toma, central part of the state of Wisconsin, that we could find a Airbnb was like a all, almost an hour drive south. And it was in the hills, the hilly part, bluff country, western Wisconsin. So uh, we started driving back to this Airbnb and it's after 10 o'clock and we thought, well, hey, well, why not stop and uh, stop for a nightcap? So we found this little bar. We ended up walking in there and. Can you disclose the name of the little bar, Sam, or is that a, I don't, in a police honestly, record somewhere in a safe? Yeah, I don't actually. <laughs> I don't actually know uh, what that bar was called, to be honest with you. But I'll tell you, we were there for about three hours. It was almost two in the morning um, when I was sitting there leaning on this table, uh, and I was talking to Nate. The, the young gun that, that tends to find trouble wherever yep. he seems to go when it's in a bar scene. And he's talking to me, and we're, we're, I, don't, I don't know, we were talking about the season, and I had just filmed the campfire story for one of our film series with his uh, with his cousin, Mike Hackett. Okay. And, uh, you know, conversation was flowing good. I had no idea anything was going on, and then I noticed him reach across the, to the right and grab an empty bush light bottle. And he pulls it towards him, and he continues talking, and then I start talking, and I see him reach for another bottle to his left, and he pulls that one in, and now he's double fist and two empty bottles of Bush Light that weren't his. And um, <laughs> I stopped the conversation, and I said, "What? Uh, what are you planning on doing with those?" And he goes, "Oh, in real, real, real nonchalant manner, he goes, I'm just getting ready to knock this guy out if he makes one more bad move." And I'm like, "What?" <laughs> and sure shit. enough, here's this guy right behind him, ready to pounce because. He was he he just had too much to drink and he had a stick up his ass about you know some TV guys being in his bar and he's the uh, you know he's he's he kind of runs the show there and we were getting more attention than him and just he just had a problem oh, and no. uh, I ended up uh, dis dismantling that switch situation before it got weird because. <laughs> there was one of that guy and like a few bartenders and and mm. maybe two or three other patrons still left at the bar and then there was twelve of us, so it would have been a, a, a raw deal I think. So but, you got those uh, those option A, option B, the young bull way and the old bull way, and it sounds yeah. like you took the old bull way out of that that uh, situation. So that's probably a, probably a smart idea. Who knows what would have happened, you know? Yeah, it was like, hey guys, I think it's time to go. I'm pretty tired. <laughs> let's go. Hey guys, let's go right now. Yeah, <laughs> walk out the yeah. door. Get the hell out. Yeah. Let's go immediately. Yeah, yeah I'm talking to you. <laughs> in that kind of place, you know, 
uh, nobody's coming to to help. I mean, the police aren't going to be there anytime soon. So no. if you end up on the wrong side of that one, um, it's it is going to be a, a bad situation no matter what. And if you're on the higher end of that stick, you know you might end up going to jail. And I didn't want anybody dealing with trouble that night. I just wanted to round off a great day uh, on for a, a high great note. cause. Yeah, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, uh, that's. Uh, I'm glad that didn't escalate for you because that could have, like you said, went really horribly awry. And uh, good on you for uh, for getting the boys out of there and uh, avoiding a uh, Western Wisconsin uh, scuffle. <laughs> Brawl. Yeah, yeah. Well, now Brawl. I can't look at a bottle of Bush Light the same anymore. Every time I see a bottle of Bush Light, I think of two things. I think of Nate Hoffman grabbing those two uh, <laughs> long necks, but you know, and then I think uh, I think of. Last last fall, when I shot my deer on opening day, and I called Travis Kissel from my team, and mm-hmm. I told him the news. And uh, before I I told him what happened, you know, I said, "Where you at?" And I can hear some background noise. He goes, "I'm at a wedding. I'm uh, I'm drinking a bottle of Bush Light." And I'm like, "Oh, fancy!" And he says <laughs> something to the effect of, uh, "That means uh, I'm trying to be formal, but I came to party." And yeah, I think he stole that land that line from uh, Step Brothers or something. But yeah, that something like funny. that. <laughs> Jeez. Well, you, uh, I would say, avoided a pretty hairy situation there with that. So, oh yeah, good on you. And uh, kind of now pivoting back to your project that you're going to be submitting to the Badlands Film Festival, and that kind of opens up the conversation to the some of the questions I have for you here. Um, if you had to explain your angle, um, I know yeah. it's hard to pigeonhole yourself into, and it's it's kind of difficult, I feel, for any producer to do because there's it's so multifaceted. There's so many sure. aspects that you're trying to film, lay down. Um, but if somebody was to view Chase Nation for the very first time, what could they expect to watch? What's What's the angle of Chase Nation? Yeah, no, and thanks for asking. I think it's a really, uh, I think it's a really meaningful question because obviously, you know, when you put your heart and soul into a project like this, or you know, even running something like a oh, yeah. production team, you know, you 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 just live for the opportunity to talk about it because it's your baby. Yep, um, and I'm proud of it. So thanks for asking. So yeah, no Chase problem. Nation, um, what the way that we position ourselves, or the way I describe it, is. We are visual storytellers. Um, you know, you can go on any streaming platform and type in deer hunt or whatever your search mm-hmm. query is, and, and you're going to find all kinds of hundreds of thousands of videos out there. And each one of them features the same concept. The deer walks in, a guy talks about the wind, and you don't care about the wind because you're not there and it means nothing to you. The only thing that means something to you when it comes to like wind conversation is hey, you know, I'm expecting them to come from upwind. That's why I'm sitting here, if you, if you teach me something. But, but a lot of guys skip that, and they just say, the wind's out of the west today. I'm sure. up in the stand again. Here comes this deer, shoots it, and then they stand over it and celebrate. Yeah. Well, that's great. Yeah. Cool. I mean, if you're into that, I mean, I, I'm into it. I love hunting. Yeah, um, absolutely. But when, I, when I'm going to take the time to sit down, and, again, I'm older, so, not, I mean, it's a little different, but I don't have a lot of time to sit and watch tv sure so when i do watch it i pick the shows that i know put their heart and soul into telling a story Mm -hmm. so i can put myself there so i can feel something and if i just get that cut and dry went out and killed a deer and stood over it and celebrated i'm like oh it's cool buck neat neat encounter i live vicariously through you for a hot minute Mm -hmm. but you know i mean truth be told that to me isn't it's just not cutting the mustard, and I want to cut the mustard. Sure, I want yeah. to. I want people to watch and feel totally enveloped into what we're. I want people to feel something. I don't really. I'm beyond. You know, I I don't really get caught up in worrying if you know somebody thinks something that I'm thinking about or doing is cheesy. You know, like I honestly, uh, that. That concern is maybe back in my 20s, I cared a little bit about what people thought, but I've, I've sure. long since given up on that. And so now, if I can invoke some emotion, to me, that is a, a really strong attribute to filmmaking. Um, this project I'm working on right now isn't entirely based on hunting. I mean, sure, it's, it's about archery, it's about hunting, it's about the military veterans and PTSD and combating that in the struggles 
so it's it's very very emotional and um i'll tell you you know and you've you've got a you've gotten a chance to have a sneak peek at the first draft i gotta send you the second i've just worked on it till about two o'clock this morning <laughs> or yesterday well yeah it'd be yep. today so <laughs> two o'clock last night this morning yep i get um, what you working mean working on that yeah, and so i got a second draft i could share with you but you know if if it doesn't raise the hair on your arms and and make you feel something and maybe make your eyes swell up a little bit then i'm not doing it right because I'm not trying to make a sad movie. What I'm trying to do is make somebody feel something so they become attached to it. And not just so they sit and watch the rest of it, but so it actually motivates them or inspires them one way or another. If it makes a difference to them and what they end up doing with themselves going forward after watching it. That's the whole motivation behind filmmaking for, for Chase Nation. Sure. And, you can't always do that because, you know, with, with, with a large team, I, I can't spread myself thin enough to go out and film everybody. But when I do get a chance to go film one of my guys, you know, we don't we don't just go out and film that day in that hunt. We're getting together throughout the summer and we're filming, you know, deer and velvet sitting on the edges of fields. And it's not just turning the camera on when we're in, you know, tucked into a fence line. And there's a deer out in the field. We're mm-hmm. filming, you know, pulling up to the spot or meeting up or, you know, the, the goofiness. You know, it's yep. if people can connect to the uh, to the guys on the screen, guys and gals on the screen, that's when you know you're doing something right. And I'm never perfect at it, but I'm definitely always trying to be perfect at it. it, it that's my passion. That's my art. Just and, like you know, you yeah. you do like you do what primarily all but or most of the production work. Yep, all of it. For Lestra. yeah, you do all of it. So you understand. Yep, it's you uh, know. it's tricky. It's uh, it's an interesting beast to try to evoke emotion, like you said. Some some deer hunts, there's just uh, there's not enough there to draw right. that emotion out. But I feel like when I watched your first draft of the HHA documentary, I definitely felt that, and I think personally. Um, I, I kind of go through my mind every year about, all right, what, what, what could it take to get another film into the Badlands Film Festival? What could it take to podium a film? And I, I just come out with three or four main things. I think emotion is the pillar um, of those qualities, which is cool that you said that. I think you've got to have a very strong storyline. Um, cinematography, I'm, I'm actually saying is maybe the, the last... Um, you know, we're not saying I'm going to go out there and throw a film together with a handy cam or something like that, but I, I would say that, uh, I've seen some less, less produced shows do the best in the Badlands Film Festival over the course of, uh, the last six shows that I've attended there. Um, and then quality I think the, is, is yeah. paramount. I mean, yep. emo- invoking emotion and, and producing something with substantial quality is paramount mm-hmm. and, I mean, there's. It's gotten to the point now where, you know, unfortunately, um, and it's not to it's not to be a jerk in any which way to you know my crew, but if if the quality is not there, I just can't. I'm just it, I can't justify taking too much time to produce it. I just can't anymore. When we sure. first started, um, I basically was like, well, we're going to be a semi live show. We're going to produce some seriously cool. Uh, stories here i want you to run your camera as much as possible because you can always edit stuff out but you can't get stuff back that you didn't capture on film bingo (laughs) and and so these guys you know some of them took me seriously and ran it a lot some some you know nodded their head when you'd say it to them but then they wouldn't necessarily always run the camera all the time and sure and and to be honest with you those are the guys that after you know produce what they gave me wouldn't necessarily be overly excited about the the, the finished product, product yeah mm-hmm. and i i finally got to a point where it's like guys yeah here's how i operate you know i work all day long every day and then i come home i've got two little kids and i gotta do dad stuff and i gotta mow the lawn and i gotta balance work and life and family and uh it it literally comes down to i <laughs> finally get the kids to bed and then lay down with my wife maybe we drink a glass of wine together or whatever Mm -hmm. and then um i wait until i hear her 
breathing change and you know sometimes that that sh- that sleep shutter when you know somebody's twitching a little bit because they're like succumbing to sleep yep and that's when i sneak out of the bed and i go down to my dungeon and i sit and edit for three four hours sometimes at, at a pop until you know one two in the morning and then i got to get up at six and do work all day start all over sure and, yep. and you know the the drill the way it goes is <laughs> as an artist and that's what i consider myself i hope you feel the same about yourself because that's really what we are is when you've got your mind in a certain direction as to the direction of the film you're producing is going. If you take too much time in between the next time you work on it, you're going to lose your focus. You're going to lose your direction. You had a good thing going. You need to get back into it and finish it. And so sometimes, you know, uh, say like a 12 to 15 minute production ends up turning into, you know, 15 to 18 hours of editing. Uh, And that would be, you know, four sometimes five consecutive evenings if possible uh of editing and that's that's a that's a tremendous amount of dedication yeah. and i'm not trying to toot my own horn but the point is is when you're doing that and you're investing yourself so strongly if the production or if the quality of the footage or audio quality is crap then it just isn't worth it anymore you kind of like guys we can't take step backward we got to take steps forward yeah so you know, if if you want to keep filming, um, at least with us, you know, you got to upgrade your equipment. And here's what it takes, and um, this is these are some of the camera options out there. And you know what, uh, my team is so damn invested; they've all upgraded their cameras. Um, um, almost half of them now are running wireless lavalier mics, uh, which is great because yep. that is a game changer. Total game changer. Um, and you know. I, the other half, you know, it, it, it's not that they don't want to. It's just it's not easy for everybody to, for a, a passion project or something that they do as a hobby for fun, uh, to go out and spend a few hundred bucks on a, a, a lavalier mic. And, and you know, mm-hmm. uh, that's that's tough. Um, and the camera gear. I mean, shoot. Oh, our yeah. camera bodies are $2,000, and then our lenses are 2500 bucks. you know, at a pop, some of them. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's just it, and you just and you can't have one lens. You got to have multiple lens for your right. DSLRs. Yep. Shoot, we you know we run seventy to two hundreds um, quite frequently uh, on our so we're running Sony A7s, Sony, mm-hmm. Sony A7s two and S threes, and um, that seventy to two hundred is the most you know primo lens that we found for low light uh, with a long range. And then, you know, there's all kinds of cool things. You can use crop factor and something that's 200 yards out or 400 yards out. And you zoom all the way in and then use your crop factor and you end up being, you know, cutting it halfway closer. It's just yeah. amazing. Um, you can turn night into day with those lenses. It's it's incredible. Oh, yeah. So we run 70 to 200s and then we got to buy the 24 to, two, uh, 24 to 240s. Um, I think just about everybody's got a 50 mil and I've got a... 35 mil that's my like little baby it's a 1.4 f-stop which is just incredible for low light oh Um, yeah especially when you know we got a deer on the ground and we're trying to you know film those shots of you you know you know touching the antlers and all that cool stuff that you see you know the outtakes yeah um and and then you know gimbals shoot um you know you remember when cribs uh, when exodus cribs came and filmed that episode here yep Uh, they uh they were running that that Ronin SC gimbal, and I thought, man, I can't believe I've been in this game for so long, and I still haven't <laughs> sprung for a gimbal. It's not that bad. They're only like two hundred and seventy-five bucks. Yeah. So I, I I ordered one up, and then uh, one of the guys, my one of my right hand men, Dave Bechtel, his wife reached out and said, I need to get Dave something for uh, Father's Day. Um, I didn't get him anything, and I feel terrible. I'm like, well, here's. She's like, I got a three hundred dollar price range. I said, all right, get him a Ronin SC. He'll love it, and now he's shooting some crispy, awesome, super. Sm- can you hear me, Sam? I lost you. Yep, I can hear you. Oh, there you go. Last sentence broke up a little bit. He's, oh, no problem. I'm last word was crispy. Yeah, he's got some crispy B-roll that he's been shooting with that new uh, gimbal that he bought, and now two other guys on the team saw some of that footage, and now they bought, you know, Ronin. So they're they're running gimbals too. 
And that is game changing. Oh yeah, for your secondary B roll shots, especially when movements involved to from stand, any kind of sort of movement is just it's I feel like it's one of those things you don't necessarily realize until you've had it. Then you're like, Wow, this is substantially better than the you know, I, I always oh, kind of try to hold my my um you know, my close my close mill lens when I've taken the 70 to 200 off, you know, if we kill, if I need to get some B roll and I try to hold it as steady as I can to my body and kind Mm -hmm. of use my arms, my forearms and my, you know, the rest of my arms as a gimbal and try to steady the camera, but it's, it's no comparison to uh, an actual stabilized gimbal. You're right. It's, it's incredible. Or we've got guys on our team that, you know, they, um, I've, I've, you know, maybe didn't know them. Uh, see, half of our team filmed with me in the past for different shows. Um, Wisconsin Whitetail Pursuit, the primary one. Sure. Um, and and that's when I started Chase Nation. It was easy, like, hey guys, I'm leaving and I'm starting my own thing. Um, I just wanted to let them know that if they wanted to um, come along for the ride, that they, there was a place for them, and most of them did. Then. Um, since then, you know, I've met people along the way and become closer with, and mm-hmm. you know, you know how it is. You, you get, uh, and it's super, super cool when people reach out and they they appreciate what you do and they ask if they what it takes to be a p- part of the team. And it's like, well, man, I wish I could bring everybody on board, but here's here's the deal: like we're just, we're we've outgrown ourselves now to the point where it's hard for me to keep up with editing. Mm-hmm. Um, so I can't just keep taking everybody in, but now and again, um, I just can't turn somebody down that I just know is going to be stellar up for the challenge and is going to be stellar. Right. Yep. And what I find with that type of person, and, and we got one right now, his name is Eric Starr and he's in his uh, second season now with us. And, um, you know, when he first got a camera, I mean, he's great at taking pictures mm-hmm. uh, and I knew he had the magic eye for photography and i'm like man if he can do what he does with a camera you know taking photos he's gonna be stellar for video yeah he he and he is he's got that he's got the eye for it but he holds a camera sorry eric like a berserk mosquito <laughs> and i just <laughs> you, you get seasick trying to watch that stuff you know and i'm like i can't yeah. i can't use some of this you gotta we got to figure this out. So going back to what you're saying about hold, tucking your arms in tight to your body to hold yourself steady, that's the kind of, you know, <clears throat> attention to detail that I'm always professing to these guys. Like, guys, <laughs> do whatever you can to hold that camera steady. Mm-hmm. Uh, some of the other tips we talk about is, like, let's minimize how much we're panning. You know, rule of thirds, if that deer is walking from right to left, put him on the right side of the screen and let him walk through or keep them on the right side if you're going to pan. But don't just go panning around like a field that, you know, that just drives the eyes crazy for the viewers. Yeah. Sim- same same with same with zooming. Zooming in and out just gets really hard to watch if you're not particular about it. You got to be <laughs> careful with that. Yeah. You see, these are the conversations that we have on our staff page. You know, we have a private staff page in Facebook where we can communicate without those mass text messages and we can share samples and links and stuff to here here's a you know good benchmark go watch this and get some ideas and creative uh creative juices flowing you know and yeah and i'm telling you it's, it really it's, it's really worked really well and some of these guys are really coming along and turning into naturals that's awesome so um Back to the visual storytellers, you guys yeah. actually have a series called Campfire Stories, and I just actually, oh, it was, it was about a month and a half ago, I actually did the Great Lake Salmon reps recipe with my wife that oh. I that I found on your channel, so um, nice. you guys also have Taste of the Wild, and uh, for those of you guys that don't know what Taste of the Wild is, it's kind of, uh, I like to call those kind of similar to like tasty i don't remember if you know like those videos they just they say tasty at the end they're like a facebook video they're like 30 (laughs) seconds but it but it's a high quality outdoor production of some kind of wild game usually um and there's a bunch of them on the chase nation youtube channel um so i would highly recommend that if you're looking up to spice up your outdoor food game you should go and check that out but um do you want to take a stab at explaining what campfire stories is sam because that's a cool project That project is, I believe, almost 
in a sense, a better format um, for telling the story behind a hunt than just the raw footage, you know, put together. Um, yep. It, it, and, and the reason is because the, for anybody that hasn't watched what Campfire Stories is, if you if you end up watching that series, and, and I'm already filming uh, season two um, right now, we we filmed season one in some of the harshest <laughs> winter conditions the upper Midwest has to offer. Yes, you uh, did. <laughs> it was it was brutal. I mean, negative twenty five wind chill. Oh, just. And some of those scenes were brutal, but but anyways, um, the point is when you have a team of guys that go out and they hunt and they film, and this is their love, you know, this is their life and passion, and they capture as much as they can, and then they send you their footage, and or you collect their footage from them, and you then, mm -hmm. it's all unscripted, and, and you as an editor, producer, you need to figure out a storyline uh, to put their footage together in a, in a way that's chronological, it's truthful, and makes sense, and keeps people interested with a storyline. That's a challenge in itself. Even when you do your best job at it, where the hunter says, boy, I, I can't believe how good that turned out. That, that turned out awesome, better than I thought it would. Mm -hmm. um, there's still pieces that are missing. And those pieces are the little details that weren't caught on film. You also don't have the hunter telling their side of the story this is my version of their story they gave me their footage i produced it it's what you see is what happened but the emotions that they were that they were feeling you know leading up to the hunt or during the hunt or some of the breakdowns in the planning um and the challenges that they faced or you know obstacles or you know all the little details this is their chance to take seven minutes uh, to tell their story from start to finish. And we overlay, uh, you know, we're, we're filming them, you know, sitting around a campfire or around a bonfire, you know, uh, a fireplace or a wood-burning stove or mm -hmm. whatever we've got available to us. And, and, you know, they pour a glass of whiskey or open a beer or crack a Pepsi or whatever, some iced tea, and they tell their story. And we film that in a very cinematic fashion and then we overlay clips from you know the hunt itself and leading up to uh, just b-roll clips that are all truistic to the actual story um and in seven minutes you get a lot more i feel like than you do from a 15 or 12 or whatever minute episode i really do um because it just it just i don't know it just hits the mark you know, a lot of the formats that I've seen um, over the years have kind of evolved into this, uh, and I and I think Drury's really um, play a role in this. Drury Outdoors, because mm -hmm. because those guys always tell the story, right? They they do their, you know, um, their their black background with the lighting on them, so they tell their side of the story, and then they go into the hunt. And they they show about three, four minutes of footage, and then they go back to Mark or Terry or whomever talking about it, mm -hmm. and then they go back to the hunt. That's pretty cool. I like that. But I thought if I do something similar, it's already been done. Sure, yeah. A lot. What Good can point. we do a little different? So I thought you, Stories is born. <laughs> yeah, I think you hit it out of the park, and I, I think that getting that – auxiliary perspective of the person that actually was there when it went down i liked what you said about the fact that you know you're given all this footage but it's but it's not their story it's your version of their story that you're actually um getting to see and and plus i mean you know this as well as i do um some popping grainy shitty audio can just totally sink and ruin a story so here you've got another chance for the hunter to lay down actually what went on that day or that evening that morning what have you uh to the point where um you can use that footage and what they're saying is going to support the storyline that they want to evoke and you are just the puppet that puts it together um yeah kind of like the messenger so uh i, I really love what you, you just said, said about too that. um about footage sometimes that has crappy audio there's many times where i've been piecing together a, a film and I've, I come across some really awesome looking clip, but the sound is so piss poor. Yep. Uh, I end up tossing it and not using it. And it's like, it's a shame because that would have contributed so much to the film. 
Yeah. But you can only do so much of that, you know, co- you know, uh, detach your audio and overlay, you know, music before it starts sounding like a music video. Right. I, uh, I think my best trick that I know is, uh, you know, on those typical days when the, uh, when the uh, manual audio levels is ja- are jacked way high and it's a windy day and we're getting some serious wind on the lapel, the lapel microphone, the lavalier mm-hmm. microphone, um, I think my best trick, I'm not, I don't know if you're a Premier user, I believe that you are, but I throw a high-pass filter on it and an obsolete uh, no- denoiser on it, and then I'll jack the high-pass filter way low to cut the wind down. I will bump up the denoiser to try to kind of crystallize the audio, and then I'll gain the audio track quite a bit. So that's my that's my kind of last-ditch effort to save some audio if I really need it, and it's a pivotal piece of audio to, to use within the episode. But, uh, yeah. We've done that a few times where I've, <laughs> I've tried to tried to work that magic, and I'm not the best yet at, at, at sound. Sure. But sometimes I, I've, I've gotten it good on occasion, but I'll tell you what, most often that when I do what you're talking about, mm-hmm. I end up getting kind of an echo chamber effect or like a like – yep. um, the the almost the the person's voice becomes so uh, crystal and everything else is muffled that it it's got yeah echo chamber effect. It's yeah, not it sounds like, like they're in a spaceship. Yeah, something like <laughs> that. It, it's a weird and, and it starts peaking yeah. too. And I, I so uh, and and you know a lot of my audio like I tend to I don't know what decibel you maintain, but I, some people I try to go like for the zero. minus six guy. I'm a minus six guy too. I'm exactly <laughs> a minus six. It's so funny you said that. Yep. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a minus six guy, and a lot of my background music's usually like minus, minus twenty two to, to minus to minus uh, eighteen, um, sure. depending on if somebody's talking or or not. Um, because otherwise, the music when you watch it on different mediums or listen to it on different mediums mm-hmm. it sounds great on your phone, but on a TV with surround, it's you know overwhelming or you know what I mean. Yeah, totally know uh, what you mean. Yeah, but 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 yeah, going back to the clips where you know audio is just crap. Um, sometimes when they don't make the cut, I, I really feel crappy about it. And, yeah. But I never forget it, and oftentimes we'll we'll notate that. I'll I'll put a little red star. You know, I use Mac. I don't know what you're editing with, but yeah. Um, I'll, I'll I'll mark that, and then I'll I'll write a little note, a description to it, and then I'll go back to some of those during those campfire story productions and. I'll grab those clips that deserved a, a, a chance in the limelight, and luckily with Campfire Stories, I don't really use a lot of audio from those clips that mm-hmm. I overlay. Sure. I mean, I just layer on top some some detached audio clips, and and they end up awesome. And yeah. It's a perfect place to use them, and those are also, uh, you know, what's pretty neat about Campfire Stories is if you've watched the hunt, you've watched the film for the hunt that the story is being told about. Yep. It's kind of neat because if you watch one of those campfire stories, oftentimes you end up seeing clips that you never saw before because they weren't part of the main film. Yeah. Um, I Have you done a campfire stories on your drop time buck yet? I don't yeah, know if I, I watched I, that. I've, I, I've watched the drop time buck episode several times, but I don't know yeah. if I've seen the campfire story version of the drop time buck. Yeah, I did that. Uh, I think that was the third one. Um, and I... Uh, that was brutal cold. We what we did, um, and it's it's you know it, just to put into perspective because one of the things that I really love about doing these is no one ever really knows where the hell we are. It's sort <laughs> of it's because it's always yeah. different. It's a unique setting, um, and and if you watch my drop time campfire story, uh huh, it, it looks like I'm in a real rustic cabin, but I'm outside. And that's because we used our expo booth outside. I pulled it out of storage, set it up out, you know, outside in the yard, and we put a, we brought the fire pit into the middle of it and uh, a whiskey barrel in the center for us to put our drinks down. And and uh, Steve, my cameraman, and, and I sat on the opposite sides of that whiskey barrel, and we sh- we shared the story. I th- <laughs> I favorite line in that whole episode, by the way. Uh, from my opinion, is right after you shoot him, I don't think you could see him, and your cameraman goes, he's dead right in the field. He's dead right there. Yeah. Um, so he, what did he do, die behind a tree branch or a, a limb where he couldn't see it? Because it was still super green when you shot him, I mean, freaking opening day. So was he, that kind of the case? 
No, he died in the middle of the field. It, that shot was lousy. I, I, you know, there's always the shoulda, woulda, couldas. And in, in that sure. instance, we had 12 different bucks around us and, and three does that I can remember. And we had deer as close as, you know, 12 feet away from the base of the tree. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was quiet. The storms had rolled through. It was noisy throughout the day, the evening. But then by that point in the eve, everything quieted down and got quiet. It was silent. And I thought, <laughs> this big buck that I've been watching all summer long, and I put an arrow into him the year prior, so, like, I needed to kill this deer. And sure. I thought, if I stop this deer, even if I softly mouth grunt him, everything is going to look up at us, and it's going to put him on, on edge. Yeah. And I don't know if he would duck the string. It was a 30-yard shot. But I chose to uh, shoot the deer walking. And, um, and when I put the... When I slow down fr- frame by frame and, and replay that over and over again, that shot was literally uh, like a sixteenth of a second be- from being perfect because it was right dead smack in the lungs, high heart, low lungs. Mm-hmm. And that deer was in mid stride and he just, when I loosen that, when I, when I let the arrow go, if I put a dot where the arrow hits, and I go back a frame, boy, it's crazy. It would have been the most perfect shot, but it ends up hitting them um, far back in in front of the hind quarter. Um, everybody thinks I gut shot them or something, but it was it wasn't guts. I hit that artery. Yeah, and yep. that deer literally ran 25, 35 yards, something like that. He he stopped. He reared up on his hind legs and he fell backwards. It was like watching a stallion run up to like a cliff edge rear up <laughs> like and all his grace and mighty power, that's cool. and then all of a sudden fall backwards on his back and he and he never even twitched he just died um, jesus it was so Holy fast shit. That's and when cool. you when you heard that saying he's he's down he's he's dead right there in the field that was me talking my cameraman's like no way no way that was the cameraman that didn't see it he couldn't get spun around the tree um <laughs> with the camera and he was he was all jammed up uh, it happened so fast, man. It just, it was the coolest thing. And I, I really got lucky that that arrow hit where it did instead of, you know, if it wasn't going to hit where I was aiming, that was the place to hit it. Yeah, you know I mean? absolutely. Uh, um, I've, I've and, definitely and, seen some, like, <laughs> I'll, I'll never forget it. It was on a uh, bow madness. I believe is like bow madness three, four, maybe. Sure, um, sure. and you know, that, uh, rascal flat singer, Gary Lavox used to come up and hunt with the juries. I don't know if he still yeah. does or not. I don't have the outdoor channel. And I remember he, it like it was yesterday. He shot the deer. Uh, it was high back. And I mean, it was probably an inch in front of the ham and an inch below, you know, where I would consider the spine to be. And that some bitch just died within i don't even know eight ten seconds maybe <laughs> and it was huge it was a huge deer was, i think I it was remember, a booner i remember that i thought it was with lee and tiffany but if that was with juries i i do remember that episode uh and seeing that and being like "Ooh, yeah god that was a bad hit and then mm-hmm. the thing was dead in a heartbeat <laughs> yeah that artery yeah, is a savior i took a lot of uh uh, I've, I've taken a lot of heat for for that shot on that deer, and I'll, I keep on thinking the same thing. Every time I get flack for it, I'm like, well, you know, he was hanging in the tree the, that night. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> what's the point in the conversation here? I killed him. Right. He was dead. I, I mean, you know, that's yeah. what we're out there to do. And uh, yeah, I just, boy, I don't want to get hung up on that topic, but it just comes up so frequently. Mm-hmm. And that's... You know, that's the other part of doing what, what guys like you and I do in, in, in our teams. You know, we're putting ourselves out there. Oh, um, yeah. Uh, you're, you're putting yourself out on a shelf to be looked at. And and by the way, that's not the purpose. You know, and you get that question, yeah. too, and some folks mm-hmm. that don't really understand why does you do what you do. Do you do what you do because you want attention? Absolutely right. not. No. So why do you do it? Because I absolutely love sharing the story and invoking some sort of feeling in people bringing that story to life and sharing it with them because i get i i get infused into watching a well put together production i love it i love yep like vicariously living through that experience and i like to share that experience that i have with others and that's just that's just it and dad and i love the artisticness of of building films and filming in general and editing um you know, so so that's why I do it. But 
you know, I took so much flack for it and, and we, for that shot on that deer. And it's like, well, you know, you kind of ask for it a little bit. You got to develop this thick skin to mm-hmm. look past it because all these people that are watching it have to do is to, to watch it and enjoy it. And, or if they feel like it, criticize it or judge it. Yep. And, and that's, that's fair enough. I mean, I'm not going to judge somebody judging it. That's, that's totally cool. I mean, if that's what you want to do, at least you watched it. I'm glad, grateful of that. You sure. Know? Yeah. Um, and I'm, and, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I've gotten praise and criticism for a couple of the episodes that I've put together over the years. You know, I, I put together one uh, three years ago where I was just having a heck of a bad season. It was an amazing season for getting in front of big deer. Yep. But it was a bad season um, as far as killing deer. Sure. I just, I, uh, I I did the runaround. You know what that is? I do not know what that is. Okay, the runaround is... Um, is when you get down from your stand, you break a bunch of branches, you blow on your grunt tube, and you run in a circle around your tree, kicking brush and oh, okay. making all kinds of racket. And yeah. You run back up that tree as fast as you can, get set, and here it comes. My <laughs> cameraman Dave Bechtel, uh, <sighs> at that time, he, he he's 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 one of my real close friends, and he, and he runs camera for me a lot, and likewise, and uh, he. He and I hadn't filmed a lot together at that point. Um, I think I was filming with Whitetail Adrenaline, and I was working in their booth at Deerfest in uh, West Bend, Wisconsin, uh, several years ago. And Dave Bechtel came up to the booth, and he introduced himself. And he asked me about public hunting grounds in in our area. Once he found out I'm from Southeast Wisconsin, because mm-hmm. that's where he's from, find out that we both, uh, you know, trampled the same grounds. So that's when we kind of hit it off, and eventually. Um, he became part of our team. So here we are filming pretty much for one of the first times together on a, on a big hunt. We, I just, I just got this lease in the Western part of the state, Wisconsin, South of, uh, South of Buffalo County. Okay. And, uh, we're in bluff country and this is the land of the giants. Sure. <laughs> we get up in this tree. We had no idea where we were sitting. I just signed the lease, you know, weeks ago. Mm-hmm. So we walked in with stands on our backs and camera and a bow and, uh, we set up. I didn't like it, so we got down, packed it up, and moved on. Uh, this is late morning. Get to a spot where I'm like, "This is this is the ticket." And we get up there, we sit for a couple hours, let the woods quiet down. And Dave says, "Hey man, I'm I'm starting to get hungry. I left an apple down in my bag. Um, how are are you feeling?" And I was like, "Well, I left my water down there, so I'm gonna go down there and get a sip of water. I'll grab your apple, and I'm gonna I'm gonna do the run around." And I didn't tell him what the hell it was. I just said, I'm doing the runaround. Yep. So, so he's like, yeah, okay. I said, just make sure that camera's rolling. And he goes, all right. So I go down there. I start running around on top of this ridge, kicking branches and brush, breaking, snapping twigs, blowing on the grunt tube. And then I grab his apple. I take a, sw- a swig of water, throw my analgene down, fly up the ladder or the pegs and, uh, or those is sticks, and then I get in stand. I hand him his apple. He's looking at me like I'm crazy. I will never forget it. I will never forget the look on his face when he took that bite of an apple. He looked at me with an eyebrow raise, like, "What the hell was that?" You know, <laughs> you jerk. You just screwed everything up. What would you like? Is this supposed to be funny? Yeah, morning's over, asshole. <laughs> he turns. He turns around, and in mid chew, he just stops and he goes big buck and i'm like what was that and i'm whispering what was that and he's trying to tell me big buck so he slowly turns his head and i'm like big okay buck. i know what's going on and i start looking and <laughs> i'll never forget it i saw the deer and then i looked back at him and the look on his face was utter amazement and here comes this big old gnarly buck with this wicked chicken foot side and uh he comes into 20 yards <clears throat> And um, I draw back, and Dave's Dave's on the camera, on the deer, perfect. Everything's focused. Color's great. This is the opportunity. And yep. all I can see is the deer's head, like his uh, upper part of the neck and, and face and rack. Okay. And, I, and I'm thinking this deer is looking at me head on because he came to investigate. Mm-hmm. So he came up the ridge, and he's, he's head on. Sure. Dave goes... You know, under his breath, like, shoot, shoot. 
he's telling me to shoot under his breath. Right. And I'm like, dude, yep. I cannot shoot. I, this deer is, I'm not going to. This deer's frontal. <laughs> so, so ends up turning around, this deer does, and bounding off. And I peer around the tree a little bit further so I could see him better. And this deer was broadside the whole dang time. I just could, I, I felt like he was looking at me. Sure. But he was looking through me oh, to the field damn behind it. us. Yeah, because we were on, we were in the timber, but we were on the edge of a field, a cut cut cornfield okay he was looking for the source of the noise and he wasn't looking at us i thought he had us pegged oh, and because man. of the, the height of that ridge i thought he was looking at me but he's looking through me and if i would have just leaned forward i would have had my pin on him and, and heart punch that deer so he bounds out and he gets into some thicker stuff and i made a um, poor decision and I, I loosed an arrow into some thick stuff and it ricocheted right before it, it hit him and that deer tore off and and that was lights out for the rest of the day now, sure. fast forward, um, I'm I'm back back in my home ground area, and I got a deer out there in the mid 160s that I was watching through summer. We got some incredible footage of in the velvet. Okay, I had not got eyes on him hard horned yet, and um, I parked my truck across the road, and that deer is bedded down or is standing over a bedded down doe, like 60 yards in front of my headlights. <laughs> I, you got to be kidding me! Out in the middle of a cut field, sure. cut bean field. Uh-huh. So I'm like, oh my god! So he ran her around. This is middle, uh, beginning of November, probably like November third, November fourth. So he must have run her ragged, and she bedded down finally in the center of this field in the winter time. There's, I mean, it's fall, but there's snow. And if you go back and watch this, you'll, you'll, this whole thing, you'll, you'll get a kick out of watching it. He ends up, uh, I go get in my stand, and I, I don't know, I'm probably 400 yards away. He ends up pushing her by me at 7 o'clock, 7.30 that morning, um, man, not long after daylight. And I hear him grunting, and I, I get the camera rolling and get it set. Uh, I'm self-filming. Sure. Um, I, I get ready, and he, here comes the doe, and then I pull back my bow, and then here comes the buck. I don't even know what deer it is yet. I just know it's a big one, and if it's not him or it's not a big enough buck, I'll just let down. Sure. And it ends up being him. I mouth grunt to stop him. He stopped perfect behind a tree, blocking his vitals. Oh, I no. I could have shot him in the liver. I could have shot him in the neck. But here I am trying to, like, do the right thing and be yep. ethical. So I'm like, come on. Oh, well, dang it. I'll be damned if he doesn't, instead of walking or taking a step forward, he goes from a dead stop to, like, a fast walk, almost a trot. And I'm aimed about. 18 inches in front of that that tree he was behind mm-hmm. waiting for that one step and the second he moves i loose that arrow and i'll tell you i would have hit him perfect but i was aimed about mm, well i i was about an inch under his armpit so i was low but sure. if i would have been you know six inches higher to heart shot him so here Damn. he bounds off now i've got my second miss on film for the fall mm-hmm the doe turns around and comes right underneath my stand. He's lost and looking for, and he's out in the field at about 50 yards, and I decide to send one in the driving snow with the wind blowing hard right into my face, and that arrow goes just, uh, was that one, just over him. Now I look like the worst archer in the world. Yep. I've got three misses, two in one day, and yep. then this other buck, uh, ends up showing up a lesser buck that was like 120 or something or one 115 on a good day yep. and i end up lacing him out of pure just like i don't know is just in the moment in and and i was satisfied i was happy i i mean i was disappointed myself but i was happy with the deer i shot you know sure but you know i got so much crap because i wasn't about to dismiss all of that that's the reality that's what happened yeah and so I told the story on film exactly the way it went down, and nothing is missed. Nothing is cut. It is pure, unscripted reality. And I got, like, I don't know, 50 likes and, like, 25 dislikes in the first, you know, several hours that that thing was published because mm-hmm. people were like, why would you why would you even air something like that? It's piss poor etiquette, piss, you know, blah, blah, blah. Get out of here. You know, at the end of the day, man, sure. if, as hunters, if you ever got a chance to talk to Fred Bear, and I sure didn't, but I wish I had, but I'll tell you what Fred Bear was an advocate of, and that was, you know, hunting in, in 
killing the animal. If you watch some of the old footage of Fred Bear and you hear some of his stories, he didn't wait till stuff was 20 yards away before he shot with his you know, old longbow, mm-hmm. you know, recurve. He was sending arrows quite a distance. Yeah. And, and, and he <laughs> wasn't always connecting, and he didn't always make good shots. And his story was, well, I'm not out there to try to, you know, um, look like I'm the I'm the best at, at, at shooting. I'm out there trying to, to harvest the animal. And I kind of look at it the same way, but I also am ethical. And I, I don't like portraying myself as unethical. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's funny to me when somebody calls himself a hunter if you're really truly invested and this is your life and it flows in your veins and you have never made a bad shot, wounded an animal or missed a deer or whatever, or made a bad decision in general, whatever the case, I just don't buy it. Yeah. That, that'd that be a liar in my book, Sam. <laughs> you know? So, yeah. so like, you know, when it comes to like having a thick skin, it's like at the end of the day, when you really, when you, when you justify it all and you think about it, you're like, you know, not to, put the naysayers down but come on who are you kidding <laughs> yeah really i mean a hundred percent i feel like uh, a lot of people they get that uh faceless human being syndrome when they're behind a keyboard and uh you know they don't know you they don't know you from adam they don't know what kind of person what kind of man you are what kind of husband family member team member company owner f- photographer etc they don't really know a whole lot about sam but uh they see the misses and uh it's an easy avenue and an easy route to put somebody else down to make themselves feel better so they go ahead and take their stab in their swing but uh yeah i i kind of feel the same way usually whenever i see a comment that's like kind of shitty or you know rude or something like that i'll just i'll just take it down unless i'm having a real bad day then i'll uh then i'll confront the person about it um so the the best line that I've been going with lately is, you know, your opinion's fine. I respect that you have one. But as soon as you come on here and you go from um, being in disagreement and criticizing, because I can take disagreement and criticism, but as soon as you come on here and you start insulting people, um, stuff like that, then i got to draw the line. You're not going to run my company into the ground that I've put so much work and effort into. And, uh, that there's a different place for that. And maybe we're not the place that you need to go and watch. So you can, yeah. you can politely fuck off and <laughs> yeah, go somewhere else. Dismiss yourself and, yep. and fuck right off, please. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, like, yep, you know totally what? get it. Totally get I, it. I don't really, I don't really like, so I'm the type that, you know, when I see the crap, I tend to just scroll past it, mm-hmm. honestly, because, once you get yourself involved in it, then now you're stooping to that level, and you, now you're going to get sucked into something that's going to be bad press. You know, sure. people say, you know, no press is bad press, um, but you know, bad press is good press. And uh, and I'm like, well, I mean, kind of, sort of, because I guess sorta. that means people are paying attention and talking about you. Uh-huh. Um, but where where you can, that can get lost in translation is when a fella. Uh, doesn't agree with something and then gets defensive and, and starts mouthing back off and then it's like mm-hmm. well shit because then now you're now you're stooping to it, their level and and that just kills it you know yep i totally agree with you i uh <laughs> i kind of like to uh <laughs> i kind of like to keep that stuff all bottled up inside let it go delete the comment or whatever or mm-hmm. uh you know unless it's like i said if it's a personal attack then then i'll confront but if it's just something like uh, bad music choice or uh, oh man let, that happens let, all the time. Let the clip play. Blah 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 blah. And I'm like, yeah, how come uh, you guys okay, don't play whatever. death metal in your in your production? I'm like, <laughs> yeah. bro, uh, that is just not the that's not our that's not how we produce. It's just not it. I mean, yeah. I even have a a guy uh, on on my team currently who who isn't a real big fan of my music selection, you know, but he's kind of come to terms with it because. <laughs> Explain that like this isn't ever going to turn into, you know, your vision per se to be like that kind of rock music or or whatever kind of music you want it to be because it doesn't effectively draw any sort of feeling or emotion behind the scenes that is being portrayed and that music selection takes hours. I, I don't know how it is for you, but for me, I spend so much time surfing through different. You know, you only have so many once you pay a license fee to get, you know, um, music. 
you know, where you have a license to use it, you only have so many options. Um, yep. And, and, and that's for whatever, like I use Soundstripe <laughs> and Soundstripe has been, you know, awesome because they, they always have new music coming out and uh, so many different genres and so many different ways to filter through their library, mm-hmm. but it takes forever. And man, uh, it's like, if you don't pick the right song, if you have lyrics, if you have any singing or voices in the music, eh, you really got to be damn picky about that because oh, yeah. it just doesn't make sense all the time. It needs to make sense. Even if the music it, like makes you feel like, oh, like I'm embodying like, the the, the 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 you know the whole feeling or the whatever behind this film mm-hmm. if the if the lyrics aren't right <laughs> then yeah you just can't use it and uh but you know you can't people are like why don't you should use uh this band or this band it's like do you think <laughs> that i'm going to get a response if i reach out to them how am i going to reach out to their manager i don't even know where right. to start there and you think that they're going to be like, oh, yeah, go ahead. Use it for your uh, for your film. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, just uh, re- use Eric Church and uh, be yeah. prepared for his legal team to sue your ass into the ground. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, like, some uh, people just don't get that. But yeah. I know. And, and well, no, if you just if you just write, you know, give them give them credit uh, on the on the film, you know, in the video or, or in the in the description and you link back to their website, then they got nothing on you. No, that's not true either. No. Not even, not even close. Once you get flagged <laughs> for that copywriting, you know stuff, uh, you only get so many warnings. And by the way, then if you do monetize your channel, and you, you're going to lose monetization on that episode, and uh, and and I definitely don't want any copyright strikes. It's just a black eye. So yeah, yeah, uh, I totally agree with you. <laughs> music is a big one for people, though. And ah, dude, I mean, come on, we all start somewhere with with editing. Mm-hmm. Me. Um, it was a lot of, in the beginning, um, how do I say it? Just crappy audio, I guess, is the perfect place to start. It was not the best quality video, sure. first of all. They, a lot of it was on handy cams, you know, old Panasonic or Sony or Pioneer uh, handy cams, uh, real old ones. Um, and, and then, you know, you'd have grainy footage at best, and you're like, well, I still want to use it because this is, you know, over a decade ago, maybe 12, 15 years ago, and you, you still want to edit something. Mm-hmm. So you end up grabbing some music, and everything turns into a music video. That's just what it is. It's clip after clip, and at the beat of the song, you know, or half beat, you're, you're changing the clip, transitioning from one clip to the next. And, yep. And and it's progressed from there. I mean, I even look back at some of the stuff I did five, five six years ago, and there's just, I watch it, and I shake my head like, Oh no! <laughs> yeah, way too much music. Or what was I thinking? You know, but that's why that's how we learn. Yeah, you know, it's trial by fire, man. And lots of the, uh, you know, lots of these uh, YouTube tutorial videos, Google articles, even articles on Adobe for you know user tutorials and things like that that are slightly interactive it's uh there's really no substitute for just trial by fire getting your hands dirty getting in there and learning everything you know kind of from the ground up on your own and uh, that's a that's a great point that's exactly the way that i did it as well i was i was looking back on some of our old stuff that got criticized you know in some years past there's like there's too much music get the music out of here and i was like yeah you're probably right there's probably too much music in here and uh so i've really tuned back the amount of music that we're using now and uh i feel like I've, I've gotten less and less flack for the music selection and choice so that's been a positive aspect but like you said it definitely definitely invokes emotion and so ultimately to the end user you know lots of people don't really know that you're trying to do that lots of uh you know lots of the community I, in my opinion, when they're going and traveling to Carbon TV, YouTube, Waypoint TV, Amazon Prime even, they're not going, I don't think the majority of people are going to watch a film like your HHA documentary that conveys a deep emotion. They want to see Big Buck get shot, Big Buck in hand, Big Buck in truck, Big Buck on wall kind of thing. And that's, and, and I'm not taking away, there's there's nothing cooler than killing Big Deer. I'm all in favor of it, but I do feel like those emotional films get overshadowed, and that's why I feel, I don't know how you feel about them, but I think RMEF, 
Um, that is one YouTube channel that I follow hard as hell, and I'm watching their films just religiously. Uh, Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, that is. And they do a great job of storytelling as well, and I just love those RMEF films. And uh, I, I feel like they do a good job, but music certainly certainly helps convey that emotion. Uh, oh, it like absolutely does. About. Donnie Vincent, um, no matter what anybody's opinion is, um, I'm the man or the hunter um, behind behind him. Uh, it's I, I, and I got no quarrel with the guy. I think I think he's cool. And, and I, but my yeah, I don't point know a is, whole lot about him. All I know is that I was truly inspired when I started watching Donnie Vincent stuff. I mean, there is a buzzkill, right, when you watch Rivers Divide. Um, that buck that that he was after out in Dakota, Badlands. Um, and I think he named it Steve. The buck's name was Steve. Yep, and yep. Um, there was a bit of a buzzkill when, you know, he came clean on the fact that that river was, you know, only about six inches deep or whatever, and it was even a challenge to drag the boat across because it was scraping in the rocks. Sure. And here, you know, the whole premise or the whole uh, story was a revolved around a river's divide or, you know, is about getting <laughs> the, the, the river was what, what kept that was like the moat or whatever, where the deer was like safe zone was. And he had to cross by boat in some harsh conditions. And I, and I thought, wow, that's, that's a killer badass. story. Right. Yeah. But, but, but then I find out that like, it was just for the, uh, for the, for the sake of film. And then I'm like, ah, man, I wish I didn't know that. Like, you, yeah. you could have, yep. you could have kept that part quiet. Um, but at the end of the day, even as as I look at some of the stuff that I do direct, like the intros to some of our episodes, which I usually tame down to about like two minutes or so. Sure. Um, you know, I, I personally, I, I do very similar stuff sometimes in order to um, get somebody wrapped up into it, and then we go into the actual film itself the unscripted part sure and so like i totally appreciate that uh and i can totally understand why he did it um but like i'll tell you what man his filmmaking between him and his cameraman uh, and their editing capabilities it's just it's second to none it is a level that i hope to get to one day um you know you you think about some of the conditions that we film in and cameras are cold Lenses are metal. Well, some of them are plastic, but most sure. of our lenses are, are brutally cold, yeah. uh, and they only get worse when when it's when it's cold outside. And uh, we put ourselves in some weird elements um, just to hunt in general. To yes. take a camera out and get your fingers removed from your gloves to hit that record button and to be able to finger on like your settings when you need to. You got to you know crank the ISO set your f-stop you know exposure whatever it is that you're messing with on your your manual settings on your your camera or even your focus you know like using the dial on the lens mm -hmm. like that that kind of stuff that's brutal and it's damn tough but some of the most incredible footage that you'll ever see are shot in those brutal conditions and uh and i and i think it's you know it's kind of goofy how, like, you know, as a as a viewer, you don't always appreciate. You just appreciate the scene, but you yeah. don't sit there and watch something and think what it took to, to create something or create that scene because, you know, that's not really your job. Your job is just to watch it and enjoy it however, you know, you, you know, suits you. Yeah, but I, as I totally a, agree. As a, as a filmmaker, I watch the way that other people make their films, and I have a – deep appreciation for the work involved because i know the steps that they're going through because i'm doing it myself and uh and to be honest with you I, it almost makes me appreciate you know watching films all the more um you know and 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 one one other thought here just as we're on this topic is sure. you know a lot of people have made comments like hey you know you you're for instance we have a large audience on carbon tv a large one on prime um we get a heck of a lot of views on ko tv uh, on roku mm -hmm. uh, but when it comes to youtube uh we we plunder i feel like we struck it's a steep climb up a very very big hill sure. um the numbers 
go and come and go in waves. You know, we get like fetch a few hundred subscribers in a, a couple weeks, and then it could slow down to a trickle. And sure. it's like, man, we we put so much time and effort in this. We got like 120 videos or 140 or I don't even know what on our channel. Everything is produced to the nines as far as what level I had you know i was capable of at the time of producing it mm -hmm. and i compare it to some of the other videos i see out there that are either half-assed or not even edited don't even have a kill in it and have fetching 20 30 40 50 thousand views in a week's time mm -hmm. and they've got like 150 subscribers and i'm looking at it like shoot we we hardly have any subscribers we have like knocking on the door of 4,000 subscribers on YouTube. Sure. And then, and, and like, our best video has got, like, 20 or 25,000 views. And, I mean, I'm just confused. Like, but, so, so when I have these conversations, I get a lot of recommendations. And the recommendations from other producers out there with their own shows that are, that are, are more successful on YouTube as a platform will say, well, you know, that's probably because of the way you're you're putting your content together. I mean, you're not regular. You're not consistent on like one or two films uh, a week, mm -hmm. and and subscribers are looking for that. And you know, you, you, the the length sometimes might contribute. You're not teaching anything. You're not trying to make this a learning um, video, which are really really popular right now. Sure. And vlogging. You're not vlogging. Like some some productions, like uh, the Hunting Public, is that's a vlog. It's, yep. It's well put together, but it's a vlog, and I love those guys. Don't get me wrong, and I think the content they put together is great. But they're, they are as semi-live as it gets, pumping out one or two videos a week, mm -hmm. and some of them 25 minutes long. And they're just filming everything and just putting it together, and it, they're doing it fast and getting it out there, where I'm taking a lot of time in between each one and... You know, I I just don't want to change our format just to get more views. Sure. Because that my end game is to, you know, to to keep us in in the realm that we're uh, that that I've envisioned. Even if that vision doesn't get as many views on something like YouTube, it gets a lot on some other mediums or platforms. But sure. I, so that's kind of the way <laughs> I look at it. It's like, yeah, it sucks when you spend all kinds of time and you. You, you publish something and it, it's got a thousand views in the first, you know, 24 hours. And then 24 days later, it's got like 1500 views total. And you're like, wow, mm -hmm. you know, you're like, what's that? You know, it's like slap in the face sometimes. But at the end of the day, I guess I, I'm, I'm reluctant to change because I, I just, I want to be different. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's know? a good point. And I, I feel like it comes all back to that. Uh, now, will it, what I will say and I think you and I have had this conversation before, and I think what separates a channel like yourself and, uh, you know, from a lot of those lesser production quality channels is this. When somebody stumbles upon Chase Nation, they watch it for the first time. They're like, wow, didn't know about that. That was awesome. And then they go and they discover an entire library full of things that are up to that standard you know, seasons that are produced with quality. And then they dive down the rabbit hole and then they become uh, a really big fan of Chase Nations. Whereas I feel like, you know, if you've got your other satellite channels that I like to call them where you've got one or two videos that are highly ranking for whatever reason, whether the thumbnail was catchy, whether it was just time of year, um, whether they did some work on Google Trends to find out when certain keywords were popular and more so in the marketing at back end of YouTube to appeal to the algorithm a little bit better that these videos are doing really well and you've got one or two videos on the channel that are ranking, but then the rest of them, you know, aren't. But those one or two big popping videos, you know, establish a cornerstone for that channel and make it, you know, a, a better well-known channel. And, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a definitely a frustrating fine line to, to walk. And it's a, it's a tightrope for sure. Uh -huh. Knowing when to publish, 
uh, knowing when not to publish, when to throw all the eggs in the basket, when to take the cards off the table. I, I personally am under the belief it's kind of like gambling. Um, I'm thinking if I if I put four videos up here this week, you know, we've got a video podcast or two that go up between us and the Whitetail Legacy guys. Then we've got our films coming down. So we've got our 16 films that we're going to be airing this season on Saturdays and Wednesdays. We're going to be double dropping those. And then we've got a series of one-off videos that are going to be launching on Fridays as well as our semi-live vlog series, which is coming out Wednesday. So I'm thinking, all right, <laughs> if I can get you know, if I can get 70 to 90 videos on the table between the months of October, November, and December, when everybody's thinking about hunting and I can rank 10 of those videos out of 90, then I'm going to populate a vich, a video that is going to live in that niche the following year. Um, and that's kind of the system that I've been using and adopting and it's been working pretty well. And we, uh, that first year was pretty brutal. Getting to that 1,000 subscriber mark was, was pretty tough. But in the first oh, year, yeah. we got from zero to 1,000. And then um, last year, we in year two, we got from about 1,000 to like 1,350, 1,400. And then last year, we went all gas, no brakes, and we're at about 57 now. But it's it's just a tough – it's a tough game. It's and a steep climb, brother. <laughs> yeah, it's a very steep climb. But uh, most of the case studies that I've done say that if you can get to that ten or 12,000 mark, you can uh, really, really blow the lid off the channel and get it grow- going like a gravy train on biscuit wheels. So um, well, you know, there's, kind of there's trying to other, get there. The other aspect to look at it is, okay, so how, what's the free – I mean, what – I'm going to go back to THP again. So I was writing for, for, for Legendary Whitetails for a couple of years, and I remember when they uh, left Midwest Whitetail, mm-hmm. uh, Aaron and Zach did. And they're like, and, and, and Greg, I know he was on at least a couple episodes with them. And they went and started the hunting public. And they were talking about on the huntingbeast.com, Dan and Paul's website. And everybody got hyped up there. Well, you got a, a huge following of, you know, Dan Infault fans on on the Hunting Beast, and, and for good reason. Yep. And then um, you got guys like Zach and Aaron who are gung ho about public land hunting, and yep. so they're utilizing that platform to talk about the fact that they're starting a new uh, show called THP or the Hunting Public, and they, they get those threads rolling, and you got this giant community on that website that's all about public land and now these guys mm-hmm. are immediately going to jump on and see what these guys have to offer so um and then they had the story of the buck nest and then they go to legendary whitetails um and one of the guys that had done some um you know work with uh with uh midwest whitetail um was like i don't know what you call that like a intern or whatever yep. um and did some of the editing and some of the back the background stuff um you know he now is working at legendary whitetail so they got it in there and end up developing a partnership that um if i you know understand it right uh helped them um put all their eggs in one basket i mean i'm not saying it was just legendary whitetails but from the first season they were able to attack it full time mm-hmm. um where it, <laughs> I, I'm envious of that because then if all your eggs are in one basket, you know, yeah, okay, it's a different life, right? We might have to eat out of a peanut butter container or out of, uh, you know, canned foods out of the truck and, and sleep in some weird places. And it's not always going to be, you know, glitz and glam with the regular salary you get or, or, or wages you get from a day job. Uh, yep. a, a day job. But you're pursuing your passion, and if your passion is hunting and filming and editing and you're putting together this style of YouTube channel and you're able to do that much content, I mean, damn, you have no option but to succeed. Yep. The only way you could have failed in that position is if you just didn't try. And they tried, and they they were largely su- successful, spectacularly successful. Mm-hmm. Now they're knocking on like 390,000 subs. You look at Seek One. Yeah, I think I think Seek One had day jobs. Uh, they knocked it out of the park with that one episode of that giant, like, hundred ninety inch deer that they uh, submitted to Mossy Oak, and uh, that got like aired. Uh, got them some some airtime, and some you know some people found out about them. Yeah, uh, they do a, a, a real jo- good job of maintaining you know 
a satisfactory quality. They're, they're using the same cameras we are, I believe, just based on the quality level. Sure. And editing is, is top notch, I think. And they've got their own little niche there in the city and, and giant bucks. I mean, who's not going to click on a thumbnail with, you know, anywhere from 180 to 210 inch deer? Yeah. And it's not just one a season. It's like five or six a season that they're killing yep. that size. Yeah. And yeah. and they've got over a half a million subscribers and they grew that many in like two years. Yep. It's incredible. It's incredible. And I'm just like, hey, man, if we could get to like 10,000, that would be sweet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? Literally. Yeah. Uh, so it's just, it's really funny. It's like, and it's not, and, and sometimes, you know, I look at that and, I'm not going to pretend like there aren't those like doldrum days where I'm sitting there and it's raining out and everything's kind of dreary and pour a glass of whiskey and drown my sorrows and think, you know, maybe they're just better. Yeah. That, that happens. It's natural because you, you do think about it. This is your baby. After all, you, you do, you know, think about it all the time. And it's like, well, why aren't we getting there? Sure. Like, why aren't right. we fetching the views? Why are people commenting on our videos um, first time I've ever seen you guys. I can't believe I've never heard of you before. New fan, just subscribed. <clears throat> I've seen that comment a lot and always been like, damn, what do we need to do to reach more people? You right. know? Yeah. Like, yeah. Who can I like pay to advertise to be like, Hey, Hey, we're out there. We're out there. Check us out. Yeah. You know, because when somebody sees it then, and then they, they see the passion behind your production and that's where the value comes from and then they become fans instantly. It's like, and they always say the same thing. It's like, well, man, if I'd have heard of you guys sooner, I'd have been a fan a long time ago. Yeah. Well, shoot, I want to I want to meet more people like that. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> you know? Yeah, that's, you're right. Uh, I don't know. I just, I know we, we've had this conversation, you and I, on the phone a couple of times before. And just, uh, it's just a... The carousel conversation, but it's it's a good one. It's I a mean, it's fickle, that's for sure. It's uh, it is it's, fickle. It's tricky. <laughs> it's uh, uh it's uh, multi layered, multifaceted, and can end up being pretty frustrating. I've I've just come to the point where I I'm under the belief that I just don't think that YouTube. I I don't personally think that unless for the value like I was talking about with you guys earlier, where if somebody stumbles upon one of your videos, they're going to really enjoy the rest. I just, I believe that there's a lot of subpar YouTube channels out there doing really well just because they are doing everything possible to market and appease the YouTube algorithm. And even if that means they're kicking out, you know, a video that doesn't have a kill and that's 40 minutes long. So I yeah. feel like those are, you know, I, I think that to get to that level of success, you know, like your hush and seek one hunting public. I, I do feel like there's an element of being a master marketer in that, regardless of the content that you are, you know, producing. So uh, that yeah. that's that's my that's kind of where I fall and where I think of it. But well, and I love those conversations with you because you, your intellect on that topic is is pretty strong. I mean, a lot of great ideas, and when it comes to sorting out the algorithm and trying to figure out what it takes to to really hit that mark that's a challenging topic and we're always guessing right and you yeah. can go internet research all you want google it all day long you're going to get a bunch of different opinions on how it works yep i do know that like um my daughter watches and she's five and she watches youtube all the time and those kid shows and, mm -hmm. and they garner millions of views hundreds of thousands of likes in the first 24 hours of oh, yeah. one episode and it blows my mind, but they're they're doing it full time. They're making millions of dollars. Um, I I just want to say that I think I've made uh, maybe six hundred dollars in five years on YouTube. So sure. if anybody ever thinks ah, <laughs> I'm not sure. going to subscribe just to make you a bunch of money, that's not the reason we want you to subscribe. We want you to subscribe so you don't miss out on any of the content we produce. Yeah, YouTube's not going to ever make us enough money to go buy milk and cereal for our kids and, and put groceries in the fridge and gas in our trucks. It's just not. Right. Yeah. I mean, not until we get to a level like some of these big wigs, right? We're, and, mm -hmm. and that's not likely. So I just, um, I don't know. I kind of got carried away with what I was talking about there. But I just, man, I, well, if you could get, if you if you published a video and it and it got, say, 
25,000 uh, views in the first 24 hours, and it maintained a 50% retention rate, you know, and which means, you know, 50% of the people that clicked on it watched at least 50% of the, the film mm -hmm. or the video, and you got, like, say, 1,000 likes in that first 24 hours. You would prep that video has a good chance at soaring in yeah. being at the top of the string when people are you know in the search in the search qu query um, you know, results anyways you'd be at the top you know the list. Mm -hmm. um, but that's yeah. all about how how to get there when uh, how to get it served. So. Yeah, and so I don't know. I don't ever want to like. I don't. I'm not a big fan of the clickbait stuff, and I know I know that mm -hmm. it works. But I don't want somebody to ever click on any of our films and then watch it and, and think that was clickbait, the way we put together the thumbnail <laughs> right, yeah. or, or the title. I want them to think it was genuine. And that might be because I'm older. I don't know. But I just don't want to succumb to, like, I'm not trying to – it's not like Facebook, you know, and having, you know, if, hey – or, or Instagram, the more followers you get, the more popular you are. Like, come on, dude. If you, I mean, if they're not real, mm -hmm. uh, what what's it worth? Like, why, why are people so strung up on how many likes they get or comments on something or, or sure. subscribers? It just means, like, hey, man, I've got, like, 18 hours into this 12-minute video. I just really want you to watch it. And, <laughs> and that's about it. You yeah, know? that's about it. I, I'm not trying to get rich on this stuff. I got a good job. I I, I do. I just, I just want the. I want people to see it and and enjoy it. You know, you know that's pretty much that. <laughs> yeah, I I totally agree with you, man. Um, so we kind of we kind of went down a rabbit hole on this topic, but it, it's a really it's a good it's a good topic. I think all kinds of people like us with shows, you know, will uh, you find some value in listening to, to our little bullshit session? <laughs> yeah, um, I. I could do I could do a three or four hour conversation on just the things that I've learned over the last twenty four months and how to um, how to try to maximize the video's potential on YouTube and I yeah we could we could talk for days about that and I really actually wish that somebody had told me that back back in the day um, and I think that we'd be a lot further than now that we are if I knew what I know now about two three four years ago when we were thumping you know you know coming down the pipeline on like season two three four or five in that little belt um if we would have been you know adopting early and putting our stuff out a long time ago i'd i would shudder to think where we'd be now but since we're kind of well, a little bit late really, to the game I, uh, I really love what you guys do with your with your um season premiere you know at, and renting out a theater and and the, uh, the whole thing the way you guys put that together i think that's that's an incredible idea it's um thank you and it seems like it's largely successful for you guys. I got to crack a beer here. I'm, no, I'm no, yeah, drunk. go for it. That's fine. But um, you know, you guys doing that, man. I was like, dude, we we need to do something. Um, it doesn't need to be the same thing. But shoot, like maybe we should. I don't know. Buy like a, a pop up beer truck or something that, and like hook up with a local brewery or something like a, and and, and like you know. Do a beer garden here and there, and then premiere some of our stuff while we're um, serving people beer. Yeah. Although it could probably get rowdy, I'm sure, but I don't know. I'm just trying to think of different ways to to reach more people, I guess. Yeah, it was it was pretty wild this year when we had our launch party. We would, we cashed eight kegs in. Oh, it had to have been 40 minutes. Um, mm. So it was just a crap load of beer that we went through and. Uh, just a yeah, that's it's a crazy amount of gear that we give away uh, to watch your you know to watch your films up there that you've kind of worked so hard on and you know your team has worked to produce and got the shots in the field, killed the deer, everything like that. It's a cool culminating event to be able to put that on for people, and I think it's just a really good way to give back. Um, so it's a pretty it's a pretty neat event, and uh, there, we have some people that travel some pretty far distances to go to it. So some uh, of my yeah. uh, favorite, you know, just thinking about your your production, some of my favorite uh, works of art that you guys have put together um, have been, I believe, and tell me if I'm wrong, filmed by the same guy with the same hunter 
Um, I, I can think of three things off the top of my head. Two of them with the same guy filming, same guy hunting. Sure. Both deer drop tines. Yep. One on a one on a run. Yep. Running like twelve yards or something down the edge of the field, drops in his tracks. That that is legend. That that <coughs> clip. Uh, <laughs> it is to me yeah. legendary. And and then the next one is that super drop. Well, I don't know what it was like a twelve or sixteen inch drop time. It was something ridiculous off yeah, his right si- side. Sixteen. Sixteen inch drop time. And that thing that footage is immaculate it's shot so well the yep. lighting the color every bit i don't know if you did any color grading but like whatever his settings were on the camera were dialed sure yeah the focus was crystal and then to get the, the he dumps right there on screen too right i mean yeah that, yeah the whole thing yeah and then the, the third one i believe was either you hunting and and garrett was filming or I don't know, but it was early morning, and I think he was 11 or a 12-pointer. It's a little bit foggy, real green field, yellow leaves, fall. It's a incredible early morning uh, setting where this deer is all bristled up, and he comes walking like 15 yards out in the edge of the field, on a, uh, kind of on a diagonal towards the wood line. Yep. I don't know, was that you hunting or was that yeah. you filming? Yeah, that was a, a buck we call Lucky. So, um, yeah, that was the one I ended up shooting. We actually had our decoy about 10 yards around the corner. That was the, uh, that would have been the second deer that Garrett and I killed with a decoy. Um, and then over the course of the last two years, we've killed another three with the decoy, including his deer, which is, I guess, I would call it the headliner of our season, uh, season seven that we'll be dropping this fall. So, um, yeah. we've been pretty successful with the decoy and it, it's pretty cool to see those deer sidestep in, uh, posture up to the decoy and come marching across an open field like that. So, uh, that, I, that's going to be pretty cool. See, I mean, not only are they, all three of those are, are big bucks, but for me, what's, why they stand out in my mind is because the guy behind the camera Frickin' nailed all three of those scenes. Garrett yep. nailed it when that one came out in the fog for you. Yep. Lucky. Mm-hmm. The color, the whole, like, everything about that was, like, I had to watch it. Um, and then, of course, everybody wants to see drop tines get, get killed because it's so <laughs> cool and, it's, and yep. it's like the unicorn, right? I mean, it's yep. just, a, it's so neat to see those deer. But it's one thing to get a, a, a drop time on film and get the kill on film. It's another thing when your your settings and your camera are dialed just to the nines and the audio is perfect. Yep. And that killer cameraman and hunter combination you got on your team, boy, those guys need a pat on the back because those those scenes that they, they captured are just phenomenal. Like yeah. phenomenal. Yeah, that's Matt and Jesse. I uh, I I can't remember. I was counting them up the other day. We're dropping a new series on our YouTube channel coming uh, coming this fall with uh, our best our best thirty buck kills. And uh, I believe since we started filming eight years ago, uh, that Matt and Jesse have killed. Uh, I think it's seventeen or eighteen bucks. Pope and Young, um, two of three of them being Boone and Crockett on film together. So that's who laid down both of those drop time episodes was Matt and Jesse. So oh, man. And, and so was yeah, it one they, of those guys? They're that, stone that, cold that, sons of bitching killers. Those two. Yeah. Is it one of those guys <laughs> that killed that late season buck out in that, that, that field that looked super cold. And yep. was a great big, buck. man, yep, that was, that was Matt. Season, right? Yep. That was in uh that was backside of season six. And uh, yeah, yeah, that was Matt. He's a uh, deer. They called fade. So Jesse actually had to swing the camera over Matt's shoulder and uh, it was a 52-yard shot. Um, Matt's, Matt's made some pretty incredible shots over the last few years. But, that, yeah, that was one of my favorite shots, too. And just beautiful, beautiful cinematography. Jesse and I were talking about that uh, several podcasts back where, you know, he shoots everything basically in as low of f-stop as he possibly can because he just wants to nail it in manual focus. And, uh, yeah, that's that's the way he runs. So, it it all comes out looking super crispy, looking very focused, dialed in, and uh, that field of view and that amount of focus in the front and the back of your focal point. It just it looks beautiful, especially when it comes together on a kill shot sequence like that. What what is he rolling? Is he is he is he 
using a Sony, is he uh, using uh, A7s? Or? We, we all have the Canon EOS R, so we're just running at 4K, 4K at 30 with uh, a user profile that we created custom, typically at F point, F2.8 if it's uh, with our 70 to 200, which that's what those that's, shots were. That's the lowest you can get on that one too, right? I mean, yep. that's... I think that's the exact same. That's the lowest we can get on on for the Sony. Uh, yep. Um, yeah, I don't know, man. I, I just I've got a real soft spot for high quality uh, footage of deer hunts like that. I mean, me too. If you can if you can tell a story and marry in some super high def quality like that, both sound, I mean, and visual, I don't know if anything ruins a good film more than bad audio. <laughs> I mean, yep really it does yeah. I mean, you could have some seriously sick looking stuff but if that sound is crap i mean nobody wants to sit through that um so this is just... kind of funny we uh we just we just finished up production i said we i guess i finished up editing season seven um you know several weeks ago and uh matt and jesse the same pair that killed both of those drop time bucks off the ground um jesse and matt they killed their seventh buck off the ground with a bow with no blind last year last deer season mm -hmm. and so um we called it grounded 7.0 and so that the whole beginning of that episode features the kill shot sequences of all the six predecessing grounded bucks and uh yeah. i think that's that's my favorite episode that we put together from last season um, that one, and then obviously one of the deer Garrett killed last year called Crunch is about 23 inches wide and just a sick, mm, just yeah. gnarly, big old five-year-old eight that we've been hunting and comes marching, sidestepping into the decoys. Very, very similar to that buck we call Lucky uh, that I killed three years ago. So yeah, it's yeah, I love that. We're real excited <laughs> to unveil that season. So got a lot of good stuff. Um, speaking of. Uh, your season if you really had to make a hard sell in a 30 second format and mm -hmm. say hey why should viewers watch chase nation because i think they should obviously you think they should what what would your what would your selling point be well 100 percent real um I, I honestly you know we've talked a lot about the quality and the heart and soul that goes into the production um, and the storytelling piece, but I mean, I think the number one, I think the number one asset that we have and, and, and you can relate to is reality. It's, it's a hundred percent purely unscripted. What you see out there is what happened. And, and I, and I, again, uh, we talked about the beating I've taken on, on occasion for showing misses or a bad shot, Sure. you know, um, not none of us no matter how good we might be at something that we do or or even some of our guys no matter, no matter how good you think you are um we're all out there learning and none of the guys on my team and i'm sure you can attest to it with yours is that none of my guys ever profess to be professionals Sure. They just love what they do, and they try to bring it to life in you know your home for you to watch it and experience it together. I mean that that to me um, is the selling point. It's it's real, raw, unscripted, and and you know I think as an editor, one of the hardest things to do. And I know Jared Scheffler can attest to this. And 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 he and I have been friends for a long time. I've learned a lot from him from Whitetail Adrenaline. Uh, is one of the hardest things as a video editor uh, is putting together unscript an unscripted format because you, you <laughs> nothing um, really goes together naturally. I mean, sometimes, I mean, when you watch it and it seems like, oh, everything flows together so well, the amount of time that it takes to piece that together and to find the perfect transition from one clip to the next and to make it a seamless storyline is extremely challenging. Um, but it's something that we strive to do with everything that we produce. Um, and and the, the number one priority for us is relatability. We want to make sure that we touch our audience so that they feel like they can relate directly to the way that things went down and shook out for us. 
because I think that if you can relate to it, if you can feel something is one thing, uh, but if you can relate to it, it's it's in that same ballpark of just awesome, you know, awesomeness. And 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 people tend to really favor uh, when they can, you know, see themselves in that position or like, you know, almost feel the wind. If it's a real windy day, they can almost feel it kissing them on the cheek. You know that that the cold in the air. They can almost feel the the, the tips of their nose getting cold just watching it and. You know, uh, if you're walking through some muck to try to get to a hard spot, you know, and you're you're struggling and suffering through some bullshit, they can feel the strain in their legs just thinking about it. They could smell the muck in the air, and they're sitting in their living room. You know, that's mm-hmm. the kind of thing. I mean, shoot, we had one episode. I know I'm going off uh, the deep end, and you asked me for, for one short 30-second <laughs> thing, but i got to say one more thing. No, you're we good. Had a, we gutted a deer, uh, Nate Hoffman, the guy who who double fisted the the bottlenecks uh, yep. of those the jacked bottles. young guns. Yep. Yeah, he 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 arrowed this big old son of a bitch, and he uh, he gutted the thing out, and um, you know obviously blood all over his hands, and uh, <laughs> he's, now he's got to get his hands on a steering wheel to drive. So he didn't have any water left. It's a long day, but we, he did have some warm bush lights. And uh, so he cracked open a beer, and, and we filmed that too. You know, we filmed him washing his hands with warm bush light right out of the can at the bed, back of the truck. I mean, that you got to do what real. you got to do. That's that's freaking real, man. You know, like that's the kind yeah. of stuff. And nobody nobody's uh, trying to hide anything, and and um, and that's relatability. So I yeah. like it. So uh, that was that was a great just overall discussion on production, Chase Nation, what values you value as a as a producer, as an editor, as a storyteller, and I think he covered all these topics really, really well. So now that we're finished up with that, I got about six more questions for you. We jump off the phone here, and they're all would okay. you rather questions in some okay. regard or another. So okay. question number one, maybe the most important of the list, Taco Bell or McDonald's? Mmm, Taco Bell. Oh, that a boy. I was glad you said that. Damn, I just love Taco Bell. There's got to be. <laughs> it's killing me so slowly, but fuck, it's good. Um, <laughs> would you rather, Sam, shoot a 160-class whitetail or a 90-inch antelope? 90-inch antelope is a damn big antelope. I'm obsessed with whitetails. I don't care how big the antelope is. <laughs> okay, so you're taking the, white, uh, you're taking all, the whitetail all day, all day long. All, d- all day long. All right, this is going to be a tough one for you because you haven't talked about this yet, but this is a fact that I know about you. Um, you are a big fisherman as well. Um, talking about musky, correct? Yeah, yeah, big time. So would you rather catch a musky or a tarpon? Oh, musky uh, in a heartbeat. I mean, those tarpon are super spectacular. They're huge and they're beautiful. But I am obsessed with muskies. And you know what? I've been fishing my whole life. I love it to death. Uh, I can clean a fish better than a lot of uh, sous chefs out there. But I hate the smell of fish, but I love the smell of musky. Interesting. There's a there's a big difference between the scent of a musky and the scent of, you know, any other fish? Oh, yeah. There's a distinct difference in the smell oh, of a musky. It's, it's got its own slimy smell to it. It's very, very distinguishable. Um, and... It, and it's not just it's not that i like the aroma because i like i want to smell it it's mm-hmm. because i like i think about it so much and so invested into it <laughs> you know what i mean yeah okay i did not know that um how about maine or florida which one of those states would you rather deer hunt in uh, i've been to both and i love the hell out of maine and whether it's deer hunting or not, Maine, 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 all day long. I love the East Coast. I love lobster. I love eating lobster rolls. I love to yeah. see those boats and those those floating piers that go up and down with the tide. I think the whole scene there is incredible. Okay, uh, how about this one? A one forty class, a one forty class mainframe deer with a ten inch drop, or a one sixty class with a four inch drop? I'll take that ten inch drop. <laughs> Okay, fair enough. Score, score score means little to me. It, I mean, fair enough. Yeah, it's cool when when a deer fetches a score, sure. but uh, but I mean, shoot, I, I had a I had a lot bigger deer in the 190 caliber right around the corner. I had access to um, last season, mm-hmm. and I much preferred. Uh, I mean, I shouldn't say much preferred, 
but I was not batting an eye at loosing an arrow at that 130 inch mainframe seven with the, you know, five and a half inch drop and another one sprouting up the other side. I thought that was the coolest thing ever. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, another one, what's your electric chair meal, Sam? What's your, my what? Your electric chair meal. So you're getting, uh, you're, you're going down yeah, life ending meal? tomorrow. Yeah. What's your last supper? Oh, it's easy. If, if I can pick it, anything I want, it's going to be a tenderloin uh, backstrap. It's not going to be the inner loin. It's going to be the outer loin, and it's going to have uh, fire-roasted or fire-melted blue cheese mixed with some butter out of a, out of a cast-iron skillet over Ooh, a bed of lump, hardwood lump coal, and, uh, and, and, and that right there is fire. Okay. I'm dying with that meal in my, in my belly. Okay. Um, how about this one? If you had to pick a new state to move to, um, other than your home state, what would it, what would that state be? Um, if my wife was asking me the question, it would be whatever state she wants me to say, but Good answer. It's, since it's you asking me and she's not here right now, <laughs> um, honestly, it would definitely, uh, it would, it would, it would definitely be Iowa. Um, I just, and, and it's not just because, you know, everybody talks about like the whitetails that they see get killed on film or whatever in Iowa. It's just mm-hmm. because I've been to Iowa a number of times and shoot, I don't know. I guess Montana's another one. I love the big sky country, but Iowa I'm I've just I love the farmland and uh I love the habitat there a lot. Interesting. Okay. I would I would have uh, I'm I was thinking you were gonna say Iowa, but um it's interesting you said montana too i i would think that that would be somewhere somewhere in my list i mean we we almost touch iowa where i'm about uh 10 minutes 15 minutes as the crow flies from the border garrett's about three minutes from the illinois iowa border so we're we're right right in the nest but um i i would also like to move i think it'd be a cool idea just an experience like no other to move out west to like a montana wyoming a utah and idaho any of those states would be pretty freaking cool yeah when you go out west i mean northern out west like you know the dakotas um in nebraska (laughs) and montana like those Mm -hmm. states those states are freaking beautiful um and deer hunting is second to none all hunting in general is is really uh awesome but you know you, when you when you ask a question like somewhere to move we're having a deer hunting discussion so i'm immediately thinking of answering the question respect you know with respect to deer hunting opportunity sure. yeah um i'm not thinking about where i would actually be comfortable living i mean iowa has some city i need a little city in my life i'm not mm-hmm. a city i live near the city in the suburbs um but i'm a country boy but i do have a little city in me Sure. Um, you know, I like to, I like to go out to sweet restaurants. You know, I love that. I love taking my wife out to, uh, a really cool, like, you know, um, you know, farm to table kind of restaurant in downtown Milwaukee. Oh I, yeah. Those restaurants are sick. And I, you know, you know, we've got the taste of the wild film series and yep. that's because my wife and I are literally obsessed with cooking and we don't cook just like ordinary meals when we have guests here we plate food yeah it's, I don't, it's I don't, elaborate yeah i don't put food on the table and and my wife sometimes doesn't appreciate that because she thinks that some people would rather pick their own portions but i think <laughs> when you come to my house to dine i'm I, I want you to leave talking about it and i don't know why but that's important to me and Fair so enough. like it's because of restaurants, really. I don't really give a damn about the bar scene. I like a dive bar. Give me a little shithole out in the country where somebody wants to fight us and I got a buddy <laughs> who wants to kill him with beer bottles. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. I'm all good with that. But but I need some badass dining somewhere close by. So, you know, deer hunting is one thing, but then, you know, there's the other part. If I'm working remote like I am right now, I guess it doesn't matter where I am when I'm working. Sure. But give me somewhere with some cool restaurants, brother. Okay. Um, last and final question here. What is something the world does not know about Sam Ubel? Huh, that is a damn good question. You know what the world doesn't really know about me is that um, uh, we already touched on that. I, I'm a I, I, I was a I'm a big musky fisherman. I was a competitive musky fisherman for a number of years and mm-hmm. had a lot of success there. And and, and I, t- I take that 
really seriously, like damn serious. Um, but, you know, one thing that fishermen don't always like or appreciate are, are people out in the water making waves. And one thing I don't think the world knows about me is that uh, I was really serious into water skiing and wakeboarding for uh, for a good number of years, probably 15 years uh, at least, maybe 20 years, that um, I took that to another level and kind of wrecked both of my shoulders a little bit on oh, uh, shit. doing it and, uh, and whatnot. But, like, I, I am obsessed with slalom skiing. Um, I don't I, – I, I think barefoot in school and, and whatever because, you know, it is kind of neat just to be on the water with your bare feet mm-hmm. and that feeling, uh, that, that tickle. I like that, but there's nothing that gets me off more than like sending a giant rooster tail up behind my slalom ski and cutting back and forth and just tearing it up. Like I, I get a kick out of that. And then, <laughs> and I love wakeboarding too. Like I love just flying through the air. I mean, I, I just, I just, I love it. So that's something that I don't ever talk about. I never tell people that. And I used to male model. How about that? No way. <laughs> yeah. Holy shit. <laughs> Uh, I would so. not have, yeah, I wouldn't have guessed <laughs> that, but okay. Yeah, that's another thing that nobody knows anything about. I don't I don't tell anybody about that, but I did that for a good decade. Uh, Whoa. Back, back when I was in my, uh, I was like 18 to about uh, 20, 28 or 29 years old. I'll be damned. I did, uh, yeah, I sure as shit, I did not know that whatsoever. Actually, I think I started when I was about 17, but yeah editorial stuff and some commercial ads but i did a lot of editorial uh stuff which is you know like the the strike a pose you know the blue steel faces <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then there was like the boston store and the yonkers and the Coles catalogs but shoot yeah i did a lot of a lot of that back in the day and then i started losing my hair and getting old <laughs> <laughs> and things uh, went downhill yeah, I don't know. My wife says I get better looking with age, and all I see is like I get this like pelican gullet going on, and uh, and losing my hair, and I'm like, shoot, I don't, I don't see it, but whatever, babe. Thanks for making me feel better. I guess. You're making me feel pretty, honey. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's another thing. So, all righty. Well, we uh, we turned this puppy into a good good conversation, and uh, I really appreciate you carving out the time. Uh, I know it gets hectic, especially with your Chase Nation schedule, with your work schedule, with the fact that you're married with kids. I, so I do appreciate you carving out your time to tell me about Chase Nation, some of your philosophies on production. Uh, I feel like the listeners really got a good chance to get inside your head with this one. And uh, that was kind of the reason why I sent that message out to uh, you, Alex Nadolski, and Max Mongrello, just because I consider you three my favorite uh, digital productions that I watch religiously. Obviously, I'm a big fan of like a Heartland Bow Hunter. I'm a big Draven fan. Who doesn't like watching the Crush and the Drurys? Uh, I really like Jason Matzinger too. Those are great traditional shows that I follow. You know, on traditional media, uh, but digitally, I I'm a, just a big fan of Chase Nation, The Rise, and uh, Midwest Whitetail. So I wanted to have you on here, and I'm glad that you accepted and uh, gave us all this great information. So. Um, good luck this deer season, and uh, you got anything else to say before we uh, hop off the phone here? Well, two things. I've had both my kids pretty much strapped to my leg about the whole time we've been on the phone, so hopefully they <laughs> weren't too noisy in second. Um, I sure appreciate anybody that's actually listened through this whole thing and listened to, listened to us BS uh, back and forth and, and whatnot. I, I, uh, I'm always, uh, I feel privileged to be invited to to do something like this and to have a chance to have a voice. So thanks for having me on the show. And, um, yeah, hopefully there's at least one nugget of gold. Somebody can put in a back pocket and take away from it all. Yeah, no doubt. So, uh, kill a big one this year. We'll talk when you do. And, uh, I'm sure we'll be texting each other all deer season long. So I hope you nail a big one. I hope the chase nation squad does well. And, uh, until next time, buddy, I will talk to you later. My man. Talk to you later. All right. Thanks, Sam. Bye. See ya. There you have it, the ramblings of two producers in the outdoors, one with way more experience, that would be Sam, and uh, I, I feel like you guys got to know him quite a bit better, got some pretty cool stories out of him, and uh, 
he's got some pretty interesting takes and I did really not honestly know that uh, he did a couple of those things in his in his past life that male model thing kind of took me off guard but uh, you guys should look Sam up check out Chase Nation and uh, I feel like you're going to really like what you see check out that Taste of the Wild series that's awesome is uh, Campfire Story series uh, they just do a great job of storytelling on their channel. So, again, that's called Chase Nation. A couple of announcements before we wrap up here. Our Season 7 trailer is going to drop on Wednesday, September 1st on YouTube at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time. On Saturdays and Wednesdays this week, we, excuse me, this year we're going to be launching our new full-length episodes. Our Elk film is going to be coming out on Saturday, September 18th. As always, you can watch a new YTL Legacy podcast every Monday on our channel. Tuesday, our video podcast is dropping. Wednesday, our Last Breath Live videos will be dropping, especially when the season comes rolling down the pipe here soon because we've got about a month left before season. And uh, we just wanted to thank you guys again for listening to the Last Breath Huntcast. Big shout out to Ch Sam Ubel and the Chase Nation squad as a whole in this episode 113 when we got to pick his brain, talk to him, learn about him. Big shout out to episode 112 with Alex Nadolski of The Rise. In episode 114, we've got another hell of a guest coming down the pipeline. Max Mongrello, a producer for Midwest Whitetail. Certainly a show that needs no introduction as well. All another one of my top three shows that I really enjoy watching. So until next time, we will see you next Monday morning at 6 a.m. for episode number 114. Don't waste it.